Yes, science deals with causation in repeatable circumstances where you have um, excluded all perturbing factors. You're dealing with an isolated system of very restricted conditions and then you can get repeatable explanation. Science does not deal with things like beauty or meaning or what is good and what is bad because there are no repeatable tests, no experiments that can determine, for instance, that something is good or something is bad. There are no measurement units for being good or bad, for instance. I can't deal with ethics, for example. The methodology of science is to search for the regularities and the things which are underlie all explanation in a wide class of circumstances for some particular objects. Now, for instance, one of the limits, the methodological limits, is for cosmology. When you have one object, which is the universe, it doesn't make sense to talk about a law of behavior of the universe as a whole, because there's only one thing. So science is assuming there's a set of objects of pretty much the same kind, and there's laws which apply across all of those objects. Now, there might possibly be a law for the universe, but there's no way to ever test it, because we can only have access to one universe. So even if there is such a law, we as human beings have no access to it. The multiverse idea is a very interesting explanation for fine-tuning in the universe, for why the universe is very special in such a way as to allow life to exist. So it's a great explanatory concept. And so the question is, in science, what matters to you more, explanation or testing? In a sense, that's the, the, um, the thing. And, well, explanation, testing or description. And in effect, we're being told by the multiverse enthusiasts that this is a very good explanation. That's correct, it's a very good explanation. But the fact that it's an explanation has to be checked with whether it can be tested, and the ability to test the multiverse is very, very small. And so it's a statement that we're choosing to th emphasize the explanatory nature of science rather than testing. But from my viewpoint, it is the testing which has resulted in the success of science. And when you say, I'm going to downgrade the necessity to test it, you are leaving behind the reason, the key reason that science has been so successful. Basically, um, the limits we get are in terms of the very large and the very small. In terms of the very large, you hit the fact that we can only see to a certain distance. Now, it's a very large distance, but the universe has been in existence for 14 billion years. Light has been traveling to us for the age of the universe. We can't see further than the distance that light has come to us. That's the visual horizon. That's 42 billion light years. It's not 14 because the universe has been expanding. But basically, so you can't see anything on a bigger scale. Now, on the smaller scale, we're limited by our microscopes. And our microscopes can go down now to the atomic scale but they can't go much less than that. And so we're limited by the fact that we can only test with microscopes and telescopes to a certain extent. Now, in the case of the very small, we can use particle accelerators and we can, in effect, test even small particles by using very high energy, slamming them into each other, see what comes out. But we're limited to the size of the particle accelerator, to the energies we can get. And so we can't test the energies which took place in the very, very early universe. And so after a certain, as we follow the universe back into the past, at a certain time we hit a barrier to what we know about physics. I call it the physics horizon, and the other side of it we are guessing. We can extrapolate, we can make very nice extrapolations, but nevertheless we're guessing. Well, physicists tend to believe in bottom-up causality in which everything at a higher level is determined by everything at a lower level. And so, for instance, um, the, the laws, the gas laws follow from kinetic theory. The behavior of solids follow from the behavior of electrons. And so, and then so they tend to believe also that um, chemistry flows out of physics and then biology flows out of chemistry. And so it's what I would call bottom-up causation. Um, that's the, the mold which physicists use. Now, 
What I'm particularly interested in is in many cases one can say that causality flows in the other direction. Um, for instance, in physiology or in the brain, um, and I can give many, many examples, but causality flows from the higher levels down to the lower ones. And so, for instance, in the body of an athlete, when he throws a, a javelin, his the molecules in his hand are doing what his brain has told them to do. That's causation top down from the level of the brain down to the level of the molecules in his hand. Physics itself cannot, but biophysics or the application of physics to the brain can test what are called the correlates of consciousness. We can see blood flowing in the brain when we have particular thoughts. We can see um, electrical impulses associated with certain thoughts. Um, that relates to the mind-body problem. It provides you uh, barriers to what you can say because certain things will follow. Um, but it doesn't begin to touch the heart of it. The heart of it is consciousness. And physics has got absolutely no way of saying anything about consciousness itself. It can talk about what accompanies consciousness, but the qualia, the feelings, the, the impressions which we have in our mind are interior to our minds and physics can't, can't relate to them.